For I know that my Redeemer lives, and that at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, then in my flesh I shall see God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> if you knew, Peggy Sue, oh, how my heart yearns for you, oh, Peggy, my Peggy Sue. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, I love you, girl, and I long to you, Peggy Sue. Buddy Holly, we've established that we know, you know who Buddy Holly is, and you know at least one of Buddy Holly's songs. <clears throat> pretty woman, walking down the street, pretty woman, kind I'd like to meet, pretty woman. Don't walk away, hey, okay, if that's the way it must be, okay. I can't give justice to the guitar riff that follows, but it's something like, bing, 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 bing. <laughs> Roy Orbison, we've established that you are familiar with the ouvoir of Roy Orbison. Tonight, Kathy and I will go to a concert that features the music of Buddy Holly and Roy Orbison, along with, wait for it, holograms of Buddy Holly and Roy Orbison <laughs> assembled into a concert at the Scottish Rite Auditorium up in, I guess it's Collinswood. So that's where we'll be tonight. So I've loved the music of Buddy Holly and Roy Orbison since I was a kid. For me, most music begins with the Beatles, but they were people who showed me that there was great music even before the Beatles. In fact, the Beatles were shaped by it, so it must be really important. So we're going to go see Buddy Holly and Roy Orbison tonight, thanks to the wonders of technology. And we're looking forward to the show. I know I am. I don't know how any of it works, but I think it'll be a good time. I don't know if you can see how they do it. But this concert... And this expectation and, and joy that I have around it, the anticipation that I have around it, reflects something about my experience of the essence of Buddy Holly and his music, and my experience of Roy Orbison and his music, and then I watched your faces and I heard some of you start to sing along, your experience of the essence of Buddy Holly and the essence of Roy Orbison and their music. And there's something about essence of people who come before us, that touch us, that touch our hearts, that stays with us long after they're gone. Because while we will hear the music of Buddy Holly and Roy Orbison tonight, and we will see them as holograms somehow on or slightly above the stage tonight at the auditorium, I do understand that Buddy Holly and Roy Orbison are dead. I do know this. Physically, they are dead have been for some time. Um, but there's something about the essence of them and their music that has stayed with me since my earliest acquaintance with it. When I was, I don't know, in grade school, maybe high school. And there's something about the essence of the people and the things that we love that's enduring and it lasts longer then brief time, these people are physically with us in this material world. There's something about the essence of one another, of the people and the things that we love, that is enduring. And so it is with the people in our immediate families and friends who have died. Their essence is still with us, not just as a memory, not only inside of us, I believe that there's something that is truly, the Bible is eternal, eternal life that remains present with us. Not only with us, but true, eternal. 
And this is what Job was talking about when Job says, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and that at the last he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has been thus destroyed, then in my flesh I shall see God. Job has a deep understanding of that, and he shares it with us through this text in the Old Testament today. It's one of the great things about Scripture, about the tradition in the text and in the tradition in the people that's handed down to us as part of our faith, that little by little, we as human beings realize these truths about ourselves and piece by piece, sometimes a step at a time, sometimes a spoonful or a dropper at a time, put together these deepest experiences that we have as human beings in the context of who God is and what is our relationship with God. That this is a revelation of the divine. That God is with us in this eternal essence of life of the people we love. Now Jesus had a very particular understanding of this. Jesus knew resurrection. Jesus knew essence. Jesus knew eternal life because it was what he came to teach. But it's also who he is. The word was made flesh and dwelled among us. And later we murdered him and he rose from the dead by the hand of the Father because his essence is eternal even when we, when we can't understand it. Even in the face of the end of mortal life. That there's this essence of the people we love that stays with us that is eternal. And this is what Jesus talked about in this engagement that he has uh, that's conveyed here in Luke chapter 20. Luke begins, some Sadducees, not all the Sadducees, but some Sadducees, those who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and asked him a question. And the Sadducees, we don't know a whole lot about them, but it deserves a brief, they deserve a brief word here. Scripture is not entirely clear on who the Sadducees were. They have a distinct place in the Gospels, but it's an incomplete picture, and they don't really appear before that. Here's some of the things that we know, but even, even in the scholarship and the tradition, the picture is not complete. The word Sadducees, may very well be a Greek-influenced word. It has some similarities to a Hebrew word called Zadok, Zadokites, which has to do with offerings and the priesthood of the temple. So Sadducees may very well have been, and there are other clues to this in the text, the Sadducees may have been a subset of the priests or some of the people who were close to the temple cult, that is the sacrificial offering process and, and customs in the one temple at Jerusalem. And at least some of them, as Luke tells us, rejected the notion of resurrection. So we have an incomplete picture of the Sadducees. This picture that we do have in Luke is not a blank in condemnation of all the Sadducees. But as Luke says, some of the Sadducees, those who do not believe in the resurrection, came to Jesus. And when they came to Jesus, as happened from time to time, and we see this other places in the gospel, when those who were struggling with the teachings of Jesus, or struggling with or even resisting the truth of who Jesus is, were working that through or expressing that, they did it by playing uh, intellectual gotcha games with Jesus. And there's one here in this passage from and they set up this scenario very elaborately, but they try and do this case study of, well, the law of Moses that we all live under as faithful Hebrews, the law of Moses tells us that if a man marries a woman and he dies before they've had children together, it is the moral, spiritual, legal obligation of his brother to marry that same woman and have children with her so that his brother's line, so that their collective ancestor's line can be passed on. And also so that the woman, the widow, 
is not left to fend for herself as an orphan or as an outcast. <coughs> it's a very patriarchal system, but there are, as happens with people figuring out what it is God wants us to do, there are flickers of generosity and love and kindness and mercy in this. Not necessarily in ways that we understand or would do ourselves, but I think you do. Fair person could look at that and recognize that that part of the law, and it's called Levite or Leverite marriage. That if the brother dies, the next brother marries until there are children that continue the line. And the Sadducees come and they set up this fairly complicated case where seven brothers marry her, and without having children, all seven brothers die. And then, as the Sadducees say, let me find the right line. Finally, the woman also died. And if you're the woman, you're thinking, yeah, finally. <laughs> finally, also the woman died. So the Sadducees asked Jesus their gotcha <coughs> question that all this case study has been building up to. So when this resurrection that you believe in, Jesus, when this resurrection comes, whose wife will she be? Because she was married to all seven. And at, at this point in the text, if, you, if, uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you're reading it slowly enough, you can kind of hear Jesus go, <sighs> okay. And Jesus recognizes that this is what will later, in Latin, become called uh, an argument, uh, what's the phrase? Reductio ad absurdum, reduction to absurdity, where you take a rule and when you want to test it and probe it or show it foolish or find its limits, you just keep extending the rule to a silly degree to test it, to either prove it true or false and explore your own feelings and encounter with it. So the Sadducees lay all this out and Jesus says to them, you're playing a game here, stop. I have come to proclaim resurrection. I have come to proclaim eternal life. And it may be more than people are ready to hear or understand that day, but he is eternal life. He is the word made flesh. He is the word made flesh and will rise from the dead. The firstborn of the resurrected. And he will raise us with him. But here in this encounter with the Sadducees, who are not ready to hear that. He says to them, Moses himself, who you draw on as a reference in this case study that you set out, Moses himself <coughs> shows that there is resurrection, that there is eternal life. Because in the story, the formative founding of the formative father, of the formative moment of our faith and people, when Moses is at the burning bush, and God reveals himself to Moses, there's this discussion of who they are. And God is described as he is the God of Abraham, and he is the God of Isaac, and he is the God of Jacob. And all these are in the present tense. Now, he used to be the God of the late Abraham. He used to be the God of the late Isaac, the late Jacob. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, your forebearers. This is a present tense reference to the God who was and is and shall be, in whom all time is one. Of whom all time is one. The name Yahweh, given to God in the Old Testament, but not spoken by our Jewish customs allowed. The name Yahweh in Hebrew is in itself, even in the days of Moses and when the text was first written down, the name Yahweh is an archaic, ancient form of Hebrew, the verb to be. And it's got present and future tense implications to it. I am he who is. I am he who bees. God is present. God is future. And Jesus has a special, personal, particular understanding 
of this past and present and future transcended in God, and this past and present and future transcended in the essence of life. And he would live it. He would sacrifice himself to it to show it to us in a way that we could begin to understand, huge as it is. So Jesus, in this encounter with the Sadducees, who are not believers in the resurrection, shows them what they're ready to see and hear of the resurrection, drawing on this deep, instinctive understanding that I think all of us have about the continuing essence of life that God puts into all of us that is eternal, that transcends past and present and future in the ones that we love, and also in you and in me, because we too are beloved children of God. Resurrection of life, eternal life. Jesus comes to show us and to open to us what the Father has always offered us. That we may be in fullness and continue to grow into the fullness of who we are as beloved children of God. That we may be in touch with this essence that is within us because we bear the image and likeness of God. We have this eternal life in us. And when we sense the presence, the essence of the ones that we love still with us, it's not just our memories. It's not just our nostalgia. It's an abiding truth that their essence is with us because it transcends these human bodies, Jesus says. It transcends past, present, and future, and it is eternal. And they are with us now. Their bodies are not with us. We have our memories. We have our nostalgia. We have our longings. We have the truth that in this other state that cannot keep us warm at night as they once did, but that their essence has not gone away for despite that very real loss. But their essence continues. And this is the resurrection of life that Jesus proclaims, that Jesus is, and that Jesus opens to us in the name of the Father. So when Job stands there and says, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, then in my flesh I shall see God. Job speaks for all of us. Jesus had a deep and personal and uniquely particular understanding and experience <clears throat> because of who he was. But this essence, this eternal life, Jesus tells us, is for you and for me. Thanks be to God. Thanks. Amen.